Astronomers using the 8-meter telescope at the NSF-supported Gemini North Observatory have captured the first images of storms over the tropics of Titan, Saturn's largest moon. They followed observations from NASA's IRTF indicating increased cloud cover on Titan. The findings shed light on our understanding of Titan's atmosphere and help explain how seemingly liquid carved terrain can exist in what scientists have thought was an arid region of the moon. Today I'm joined by Henry Rowe of Lowell Observatory and Mike Brown of Caltech, who along with lead author Emily Schaller of the University of Hawaii at Honolulu and Tapio Schneider, also of Caltech, uh, will publish their findings in this Thursday's issue of the journal Nature. Uh, so first off, Henry, what did you guys see? So we've been using a several different telescopes on the ground to study Titan's weather uh, as often as possible over the last few years. And with one of these telescopes, the 3-meter NASA IRTF, we've been watching Titan almost every night for several years. And for about two years, things have been pretty calm on Titan. Very few clouds, very little activity. Until April 13th last year, and our IRTF program showed that something big was starting to happen. We brought in the Gemini 8-meter telescope on the next day, April 14th, and on almost every night for about a month and a half or two following that, and saw an enormous event occur that kicked off cloud activity uh, all over the southern hemisphere. Uh, this was interesting for several reasons. One of it was about the largest event we'd seen for uh, many years, and it also showed how cloud activity in one area of the planet uh, can kick off activity anywhere else in the same hemisphere, including over areas that are usually thought of as arid and dry. So the images that you've caught, uh, they rival the re resolution of space-based telescopes. Um, what's changed in the ground-based world? Uh, what, what are we expecting in the future? I guess either one of you can answer that. But let me jump in on this one, is that the, the, one of the reasons that this, uh, this study was so powerful is because from the ground we can take um, beautifully detailed images of Titan and see where the storms are, are and see where they're moving across the surface. And, uh, and the reason we can do that, and, and we couldn't do that even just a few years ago, is because of this new technique um, of adaptive optics that exists on telescopes, where the adaptive optics um, corrects for the effects of the, the blurring in the Earth's atmosphere and you take this otherwise very blurry, shimmery image and you switch on the switch to your adaptive optics and suddenly you get this, this nice, clean picture. These nice, clean pictures of Titan that we get are, are the best pictures that you can get from the vicinity of the Earth, including from space. So we're, we're, we're better than, uh, than anything else except for things that happen to be flying right there around Titan, which have a, a little bit of an unfair advantage. And mentioning the ones that are flying around Titan, um why are we looking at Titan with telescopes from Earth if there is a spacecraft that's flying around it all the time? Well, the Cassini spacecraft returns much higher resolution images than we get, but it only flies by Titan every few weeks or every month or so. And so it's like it gets a snapshot um, every now and then on Titan, but we can look at Titan almost every night from the ground. This event that we saw back in April and May of 2008 Cassini didn't actually have a flyby until the very end of the event and missed almost the entire event. So the power of ground-based observing is that we can observe almost every night, and in fact by using telescopes in different locations going into the future, we'll be able to observe even um, every night on the Earth, even when it's cloudy at one location on Earth. Very cool. Yeah, it was actually it was, uh, really interesting to look at the Cassini data that had come from, uh, from the same event. It came, it came near the very end of this whole month-long series of storms that we had seen. And you could tell from the, from the very detailed Cassini data that there was something funny that had happened, but it was just little splotchy clouds spread everywhere. And, um, and so they, they had no idea that it had, that it had been the end of this month-long series of events. The, the, the interesting thing about it is how this whole series of, of uh, events unfolded over the equator, which really shows you where, where clouds can move to. And, and with just a snapshot, it's, uh, it's a little hard to tell what's happening. Great. Um, I'm going to take a second here to remind everybody listening, we've had some new reporters join in, that if you want to ask a question, all you do is press star 1 on your touchtone phone. You'll be placed into a queue, and then we'll bring you right into the discussion. Um, if you're listening uh, on webcast and want to send an email question, just send the, the question to webcast at nsf.gov. Okay, great. Um, one other question along those lines, uh, getting to the basics, uh, why is Titan of such great interest to astronomers? Titan is an amazing place. Um, almost every process that you see occurring on Titan in terms of 
cloud formation or in terms of streams on the surface has an analog here on Earth, but it's with alien materials. Uh, of course, on Earth, our clouds are made of water. On Titan, it's far too cold for water to be liquid and be in the clouds. It, it acts, water acts like an, a rock on the surface of Titan. But instead, on Titan, conditions are just right for methane to be a liquid and flow on the surface or form clouds in the atmosphere. So you have a whole weather system based on methane on Titan. Just an analogy to the um, water-based weather system here on Earth. And similarly, you have seasons on Titan, just like you have seasons on Earth, and for much the same reasons. Titan, is, its rotation is tilted over a little bit, a few more degrees than Earth, but it is years, 30 Earth years long. So you're seeing slow seasonal evolution of, these, of this methane weather. Very cool. And it looks like now we have a question from uh, David Perlman, who's on the line. If we can go ahead and connect him into the call, David. Yeah, thanks for calling. <laughs> I'm tuned in late, and I just need to know who the two guys are talking. One different voice is different than the other. Sure. At the moment, I have other questions later. Okay. Uh, well, let me go ahead and introduce them again. We have uh, on camera, we have um, Henry Rowe from Lowell Observatory. And by telephone, we have Mike Brown from Caltech. Oh, okay. Thanks. Sure. And did you have questions you wanted to add now or you want to ask later? I emailed you one. Okay. It may not have come through yet. Do you want to go ahead and bring it up? Uh, yeah. Well, I can, I can just uh, tell you. Uh, I was trying to find out whether one, <clears throat> to what extent the atmosphere that you've discovered, you've determined, uh, is different in any way from the atmosphere as perceived uh, during the Huygens landing uh, back whenever that was, I forgot. A couple of years ago, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and it's one of the sort of fascinating things uh, about this study. From, from the Huygens landing, and, and Huygens landed very close to the equator, and um, it looked very much like the atmosphere was, was dry and sort of, sort of desert-like and couldn't support rain or clouds. And yet, from, from that landing, if you looked around at the terrain, you saw these these things that look just like beautiful stream-carved valleys and, and, and almost shorelines. And so people have been scratching their heads for a long time about how to put those two observations together. Uh, we, we think that this is an important part of the, the story, which is that a storm somewhere else, a storm um, that, that one of these storms like we saw that occurred in a different place, can cause clouds and, and rain at many different locations around the planet. So even though these, these very desert-looking regions um, seem to be dry, seem to not be capable of having storms, they can be, they can be driven from, from other places around the planet. Great. Um, one of the things I was going to ask again is, is about the observations that you've seen. Um, they must be raising new questions. So in, in some ways they answer some questions, and in other ways they, they're raising new ones. What, what is this uh, bringing to mind as far as where to go next? Well, one of the biggest questions in my mind is how frequently do these types of large events occur? Uh, we have record of about of three of them over the past decade and a half. Um, the first one in 1995, we have only a little bit of data on, but it appeared to be a similar size magnitude of event. Another one in 2004 that we covered quite well with Gemini observations and a few other telescope observations, and now this one. There are hints that they occur more frequently, and so we continue to want to observe as often as possible and bring in other telescopes where that makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting. On in this, this study, we really focused on the aftermath of this essentially an atmospheric explosion. This, this explosion happens just, just in the, the very southern part of the tropics, and this, this, this atmospheric explosion sends, sends, uh, sends waves and clouds throughout the southern hemisphere. Um, but we don't talk very much about what causes this atmospheric explosion, and, and the reason we don't talk much about it is because we're not, we're not sure. We, we are suspicious that there's, that there's something happening in this one particular spot on the surface of Titan, um, but we don't we don't know what, and so we are we are going to be carefully watching uh, all around Titan to see if there are any special locations where these strange sorts of things seem to happen, and then see if we can try to figure out what's going on there. 